The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter Thirteen A Sight Which I Shall Never Forget. Just as the sun was setting upon that melancholy night, I saw the lonely figure of the Indian upon the vast plain beneath me, and I watched him, our one faint hope of salvation, until he disappeared in the rising mists of evening which lay, rose-tinted from the setting sun, between the far-off river and me. It was quite dark when I at last turned back to our stricken camp, and my last vision as I went was the red gleam of Zambo's fire, the one point of light in the wide world below, as was his faithful presence in my own shadowed soul. And yet I felt happier than I had done since this crushing blow had fallen upon me, for it was good to think that the world should know what we had done, so that at the worst our names should not perish with our bodies, but should go down to posterity associated with the result of our labours. It was an awesome thing to sleep in that ill-fated camp, and yet it was even more unnerving to do so in the jungle. One or the other it must be. Prudence, on the one hand, warned me that I should remain on guard, but exhausted nature, on the other, declared that I should do nothing of the kind. I climbed up on to a limb of the great ginkgo tree, but there was no secure perch on its rounded surface, and I should certainly have fallen off and broken my neck the moment I began to doze. I got down, therefore, and pondered over what I should do. Finally I closed the door of the zareba, lit three separate fires in a triangle, and having eaten a hearty supper, dropped off into a profound sleep, from which I had a strange and most welcome awakening. In the early morning, just as day was breaking, a hand was laid upon my arm, and starting up, with all my nerves in a tingle and my hand feeling for a rifle, I gave a cry of joy as in the cold grey light I saw Lord John Roxton kneeling beside me. It was he, and yet it was not he. I had left him calm in his bearing, correct in his person, prim in his dress. Now he was pale and wild-eyed, gasping as he breathed like one who has run far and fast. His gaunt face was scratched and bloody, his clothes were hanging in rags, and his hat was gone. I stared in amazement, but he gave me no chance for questions. He was grabbing at our stores all the time he spoke. "'Quick, young fella, quick!' he cried. "'Every moment counts. Get the rifles, both of them. I have the other two. Now, all the cartridges you can gather. Fill up your pockets. Now, some food. Half a dozen tins will do. That's all right. Don't wait to talk or think. Get a move on, or we are done.' Still half awake, and unable to imagine what it all might mean, I found myself hurrying madly after him through the wood, a rifle under each arm, and a pile of various stores in my hands. He dodged in and out through the thickest of the scrub until he came to a dense clump of brushwood. Into this he rushed, regardless of thorns, and threw himself into the heart of it, pulling me down by his side. "'There!' he panted. I think we are safe here. They'll make for the camp as sure as fate. It will be their first idea. But this should puzzle them. What is it all? I asked when I had got my breath. Where are the professors? And who is it that is after us? The ape-men! he cried. My God! What brutes! Don't raise your voice, for they have long ears. Sharp eyes, too, but no power of scent so far as I could judge, so I don't think they can sniff us out. Where have you been, young fella? You are well out of it. In a few sentences I whispered what I had done. Pretty bad, said he, when he had heard of the dinosaur and the pit. It isn't quite the place for a rescue, what? But I had no idea what its possibilities were until those devils got hold of us. The man-eaten Papuans had me once— but they are Chesterfields compared to this crowd. How did it happen? I asked. It was in the early morning. Our learned friends were just stirring. Hadn't even begun to argue yet. Suddenly it rained apes. They came down as thick as apples out of a tree. They had been assembling in the dark, I suppose, until that great tree over our heads was heavy with them. 
I shot one of them through the belly, but before we knew where we were they had us spread-eagled on our backs. I called them apes, but they carried sticks and stones in their hands and jabbered talk to each other, and ended up by tying our hands with creepers. So they are ahead of any beast that I have seen in my wanderings. Ape men, that's what they are, missin' links, and I wish they had stayed missin'. They carried off their wounded comrade, he was bleedin' like a pig, and then they sat around us, and if ever I saw frozen murder, it was in their faces. They were big fellows, as big as a man, and a deal stronger. Curious glassy grey eyes they have, under red tufts, and they just sat and gloated and gloated. Challenger is no chicken, but even he was cowed. He managed to struggle to his feet, and yelled out at them to have done with it and get it over. I think he had gone a bit off his head at the suddenness of it, for he raged and cursed at them like a lunatic. If they had been a row of his favourite pestmen he could not have slanged them worse. Well, what did they do? I was enthralled by the strange story which my companion was whispering into my ear, while all the time his keen eyes were shooting in every direction, and his hand grasping his cocked rifle. I thought it was the end of us, but instead of that it started them on a new line. They all jabbered and chattered together. Then one of them stood out beside Challenger. You'll smile, young fellow, but upon my word they might have been kinsmen. I couldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. This old ape-man— he was their chief, was a sort of red challenger, with every one of our friend's beauty points, only just a trifle more so. He had the short body, the big shoulders, the round chest, no neck, a great ruddy frill of a beard, the tufted eyebrows, the what-do-you-want, damn you, look about the eyes, and the whole catalogue. When the ape-man stood by challenger and put his paw on his shoulder, the thing was complete. Summerlee was a bit hysterical, and he laughed till he cried. The ape-men laughed, too, or at least they put up the devil of a cacklin, and they set to work to drag us off through the forest. They wouldn't touch the guns and things, thought them dangerous, I expect, but they carried away all our loose food. Summerlee and I got some rough handling on the way. There's my skin and my clothes to prove it for well, they took us a bee-line through the brambles, and their own hides are like leather. But Challenger was all right. Four of them carried him shoulder-high, and he went like a Roman emperor. What's that? It was a strange clicking noise in the distance, not unlike castanets. There they go, said my companion, slipping cartridges into the second double-barreled express. Load them all up, young fellow, my lad for we're not going to be taken alive, and don't you think it. That's the row they make when they are excited. By George! They'll have something to excite them if they put us up. The last stand of the greys won't be in it. With their rifles grasped and their stiffened hands, mid a ring of the dead and dying, as some fathead sings. Can you hear them now? Very far away. That little lot will do no good but I expect their search-parties are all over the wood. Well, I was telling you my tale of woe. They got us soon to this town of theirs, about a thousand huts of branches and leaves, and a great grove of trees near the edge of the cliff. It's three or four miles from here. The filthy beasts fingered me all over, and I feel as if I should never be clean again. They tied us up. The fellow who handled me could tie like a bosun, and there we lay with our toes up, beneath a tree, while a great brute stood guard over us with a club in his hand. When I say we, I mean Summerlee and myself. Old Challenger was up a tree, eating pines and having the time of his life. I'm bound to say that he managed to get some fruit to us, and with his own hands he loosened our bonds. If you'd seen him sitting up in that tree hobnobbing with his twin brother, and singing in that rolling bass of his, Ring out, wild bells! Cause music of any kind seemed to put em in a good humour. You'd have smiled. But we weren't in much mood for laughing, as you can guess. 
they were inclined, within limits, to let him do what he liked, but they drew the line pretty sharply at us. It was a mighty consolation to us all to know that you were running loose and had the archives in your keeping. Well now, young fella, I'll tell you what will surprise you. You say you saw signs of men, and fires, traps, and the like. Well, we have seen the natives themselves. Poor devils they were, down-faced little chaps, and had enough to make them so. It seems that the humans hold one side of this plateau, over yonder where you saw the caves, and the ape-men hold this side, and there is bloody war between them all the time. That's the situation, so far as I could follow it. Well, yesterday the ape-men got hold of a dozen of the humans, and brought them in as prisoners. You never heard such a jabbering and shrink it in your life. The men were little red fellows, and had been bitten and clawed so that they could hardly walk. The ape-men put two of them to death there and then, fairly pulled the arm off one of them. It was perfectly beastly. Plucky little chaps they are hardly gave a squeak, but it turned us absolutely sick. Summerlee fainted, and even Challenger had as much as he could stand. I think they have cleared, don't you? We listened intently, but nothing save the calling of the birds broke the deep peace of the forest. Lord Roxton went on with his story. I think you have had the escape of your life, young fella, my lad. It was catching those Indians that put you clean out of their heads, else they would have been back to the camp for you, as sure as fate and gathered you in. Of course, as you said, they had been watching us from the beginning out of that tree, and they knew perfectly well that we were one short. However, they could think only of this new hall, so it was I, and not a bunch of apes, that dropped in on you in the morning. Well, we had a horrid business afterwards. My God, what a nightmare the whole thing is! You remember the great bristle of sharp canes down below where we found the skeleton of the American? Well, that is just under Ape Town, and that's the jumping off place of their prisoners. I expect there's heaps of skeletons there, if we looked for them. They have a sort of clear parade ground on the top, and they make a proper ceremony about it. One by one the poor devils have to jump and the game is to see whether they are merely dashed to pieces, or whether they get skewered on the canes. They took us out to see it, and the whole tribe lined up on the edge. Four of the Indians jumped, and the canes went through them like knitting needles through a pat of butter. No wonder we found that poor Yankee skeleton with the canes growing between his ribs. It was horrible, but it was deucedly interesting, too. We were all fascinated to see them take the dive, even when we thought it would be our turn next on the springboard. Well, it wasn't. They kept six of the Indians up for today, that's how I understood it, but I fancy we were to be the star performers in the show. Challenger might get off, but Summerlee and I were in the bill. Their language is more than half signs, and it was not hard to follow them so I thought it was time we made a break for it. I had been plotting it out a bit, had one or two things clear in my mind. It was all on me, for Summerlee was useless, and Challenger not much better. The only time they got together they got slanging because they couldn't agree upon the scientific classification of these red-headed devils that had got hold of us. One said it was the Dryopithecus of Java, the other said it was Pithecanthropus, Madness, I call it. Loonies, both. But, as I say, I had thought out one or two points that were helpful. One was that these brutes could not run as fast as a man in the open. They have short bandy legs, you see, and heavy bodies. Even Challenger could give a few yards and a hundred to the best of them, and you or I would be a perfect shrub. Another point was that they knew nothing about guns. I don't believe they ever understood how the fellow I shot came by his hurt. If we could get at our guns there was no saying what we could do. So I broke away early this morning, gave my guard a kick in the tummy that laid him out, and sprinted for the camp. There I got you and the guns, and here we are. 
"'But the professors!' I cried in consternation. "'Well, we must just go back and fetch em. I couldn't bring em with me. Challenger was up the tree. Summerlee was not fit for the effort. The only chance was to get the guns and try a rescue. Of course they may scupper them at once in revenge. I don't think they would touch Challenger, but I wouldn't answer for Summerlee. But they would have had him in any case. Of that I am certain. So I haven't made matters any worse by Bolton. But we are honour-bound to go back and have them out or see it through with them. So you can make up your soul, young fellow, my lad, for it will be one way or the other before evening." I have tried to imitate here Lord Roxton's jerky talk, his short, strong sentences, the half-humorous, half-reckless tone that ran through it all. But he was a born leader. As danger thickened, his jaunty manner would increase, his speech become more racy, his cold eyes glitter into ardent life and his Don Quixote moustache bristle with joyous excitement, his love of danger, his intense appreciation of the drama of an adventure, all the more intense for being held tightly in, his consistent view that every peril in life is a form of sport, a fierce game betwixt you and fate, with death as a forfeit, made him a wonderful companion at such hours. If it were not for our fears as to the fate of our companions, it would have been a positive joy to throw myself with such a man into such an affair. We were rising from our brushwood hiding-place, when suddenly I felt his grip upon my arm. "'By George!' he whispered. "'Here they come!' From where we lay we could look down a brown aisle, arched with green, formed by the trunks and branches. Along this a party of the eight men were passing. They went in single file with bent legs and rounded backs, their hands occasionally touching the ground, their heads turning to left and right as they trotted along. Their crouching gait took away from their height, but I should put them at five feet or so, with long arms and enormous chests. Many of them carried sticks, and at the distance they looked like a line of very hairy and deformed human beings. For a moment I caught this clear glimpse of them then they were lost among the bushes. "'Not this time,' said Lord John, who had caught up his rifle. "'Our best chance is to lie quiet until they have given up the search. Then we shall see whether we can't get back to their town and hit em where it hurts most. Give em an hour, and we'll march.' We filled in the time by opening one of our food tins and making sure of our breakfast. Lord Roxton had had nothing but some fruit since the morning before, and ate like a starving man. Then, at last, our pockets bulging with cartridges and a rifle in each hand, we started off upon our mission of rescue. Before leaving it we carefully marked our little hiding-place among the brushwood, and its bearing to Fort Challenger, that we might find it again if we needed it. We slunk through the bushes in silence, until we came to the very edge of the cliff close to the old camp. There we halted, and Lord John gave me some idea of his plans. "'So long as we are among the thick trees, these swine are our masters,' said he. "'They can see us, and we cannot see them. But in the open it is different. There we can move faster than they. So we must stick to the open all we can. The edge of the plateau has fewer large trees than further inland.' So that's our line of advance. Go slowly, keep your eyes open and your rifle ready. Above all, never let them get you prisoner while there is a cartridge left. That's my last word to you, young fellow. When we reached the edge of the cliff I looked over and saw our good old black Zambo sitting smoking on a rock below us. I would have given a great deal to have hailed him and told him how we were placed but it was too dangerous, lest we should be heard. The woods seemed to be full of the ape-men. Again and again we heard their curious clicking chatter. At such times we plunged into the nearest clumps of bushes, and lay still until the sound had passed away. Our advance, therefore, was very slow, and two hours at least must have passed before I saw by Lord John's cautious movements that we must be close to our destination. He motioned to me to lie still, 
and he crawled forward himself. In a minute he was back again, his face quivering with eagerness. Come, said he, come quick. I hope to the Lord we are not too late already. I found myself shaking with nervous excitement as I scrambled forward and lay down beside him, looking out through the bushes at a clearing which stretched before us. It was a sight which I shall never forget until my dying day. So weird, so impossible, that I do not know how I am to make you realize it, or how in a few years I shall bring myself to believe in it, if I live to sit out once more on a lounge in the Savage Club and look out on the drab solidity of the embankment. I know that it will seem then to be some wild nightmare, some delirium of fever. Yet I will set it down now, while it is still fresh in my memory, and one at least, the man who lay in the damp grasses by my side, will know if I have lied. A wide open space lay before us, some hundreds of yards across, all green turf and low bracken growing to the very edge of the cliff. Round this clearing there was a semicircle of trees with curious huts built of foliage, piled one above the other among the branches. A rookery, with every nest a little house, would best convey the idea. The openings of these huts and the branches of the trees were thronged with a dense mob of ape people, whom from their size I took to be the females and infants of the tribe. They formed the background of the picture, and were all looking out with eager interest at the same scene which fascinated and bewildered us. In the open, and near the edge of the cliff, there had assembled a crowd of some hundred of these shaggy, red-haired creatures, many of them of immense size, and all of them horrible to look upon. There was a certain discipline among them, for none of them attempted to break the line which had been formed. In front there stood a small group of Indians, little, clean-limbed, red fellows, whose skins glowed like polished bronze in the strong sunlight. A tall, thin white man was standing beside them, his head bowed, his arms folded, his whole attitude expressive of his horror and dejection. There was no mistaking the angular form of Professor Summerlee. In front of and around this dejected group of prisoners were several ape-men, who watched them closely and made all escape impossible. Then, right out from all the others and close to the edge of the cliff, were two figures, so strange and under other circumstances so ludicrous, that they absorbed my attention. The one was our comrade, Professor Challenger. The remains of his coat still hung in strips from his shoulders, but his shirt had been all torn out, and his great beard merged itself in the black tangle which covered his mighty chest. He had lost his hat, and his hair, which had grown long in our wanderings, was flying in wild disorder. A single day seemed to have changed him from the highest product of modern civilization to the most desperate savage in South America. Beside him stood his master, the king of the ape-men. In all things he was, as Lord John had said, the very image of our professor, save that his coloring was red instead of black. The same short, broad figure, the same heavy shoulders, the same forward hang of the arms, the same bristling beard merging itself in the hairy chest. Only above the eyebrows, where the sloping forehead and low-curved skull of the ape-men were in sharp contrast to the broad brow and magnificent cranium of the European, could one see any marked difference. At every other point the king was an absurd parody of the professor. All this, which takes me so long to describe, impressed itself upon me in a few seconds. Then we had very different things to think of, for an active drama was in progress. Two of the ape men had seized one of the Indians out of the group and dragged him forward to the edge of the cliff. The king raised his hand as a signal. They caught the man by his leg and arm, and swung him three times backwards and forwards with tremendous violence. Then, with a frightful heave, they shot the poor wretch over the precipice. With such force did they throw him that he curved high in the air before beginning to drop. As he vanished from sight, 
the whole assembly, except the guards, rushed forward to the edge of the precipice, and there was a long pause of absolute silence, broken by a mad yell of delight. They sprang about, tossing their long, hairy arms in the air, and howling with exultation. Then they fell back from the edge, formed themselves again into line, and waited for the next victim. This time it was Summerlee. Two of his guards caught him by the wrist and pulled him brutally to the front. His thin figure and long limbs struggled and fluttered like a chicken being dragged from a coop. Challenger had turned to the king and waved his hands frantically before him. He was begging, pleading, imploring for his comrade's life. The ape-man pushed him roughly aside and shook his head. It was the last conscious movement he was to make upon earth. Lord John's rifle cracked, and the king sank down, a tangled red sprawling thing, upon the ground. "'Shoot into the thick of them! Shoot, Sonny, shoot!' cried my companion. There are strange red depths in the soul of the most commonplace man. I am tender-hearted by nature, and have found my eyes moist many a time over the scream of a wounded hare. Yet the blood-lust was on me now. I found myself on my feet, emptying one magazine, then the other, clicking open the breech to reload, snapping it to again, while cheering and yelling with pure ferocity and joy of slaughter as I did so. With our four guns the two of us made a horrible havoc. Both the guards who held Summerlee were down, and he was staggering about like a drunken man in his amazement, unable to realize that he was a free man. The dense mob of ape-men ran about in bewilderment, marveling whence the storm of death was coming, or what it might mean. They waved, gesticulated, screamed, and tripped up over those who had fallen. Then, with a sudden impulse, they all rushed in a howling crowd to the trees for shelter, leaving the ground behind them spotted with their stricken comrades. The prisoners were left for the moment standing alone in the middle of the clearing. Challenger's quick brain had grasped the situation. He seized the bewildered Summerlee by the arm, and they both ran towards us. Two of their guards bounded after them and fell to two bullets from Lord John. We ran forward into the open to meet our friends, and pressed a loaded rifle into the hands of each. But Summerlee was at the end of his strength. He could hardly totter. Already the ape men were recovering from their panic. They were coming through the brushwood and threatening to cut us off. Challenger and I ran Summerlee along, one at each of his elbows, while Lord John covered our retreat, firing again and again as savage heads snarled at us out of the bushes. For a mile or more the chattering brutes were at our very heels. Then the pursuit slackened, for they learned our power, and would no longer face that unerring rifle. When we had at last reached the camp, we looked back and found ourselves alone. So it seemed to us, and yet we were mistaken. We had hardly closed the thornbush door of our zareba, clasped each other's hands, and thrown ourselves panting upon the ground beside our spring, when we heard a patter of feet, and then a gentle, plaintive crying from outside our entrance. Lord Roxton rushed forward, rifle in hand, and threw it open. There, prostrate upon their faces, lay the little red figures of the four surviving Indians, trembling with fear of us, and yet imploring our protection. With an expressive sweep of his hands one of them pointed to the woods around them, and indicated that they were full of danger. Then, darting forward, he threw his arms round Lord John's legs, and rested his face upon them. "'By George!' cried our peer, pulling at his moustache in great perplexity. "'I say, what the deuce are we to do with these people? Get up, little chappie, take your face off my boots.' Summerlee was sitting up and stuffing some tobacco into his old briar. "'We've got to see them safe,' said he. "'You pulled us all out of the jaws of death.' "'My word, it was a good bit of work!' "'Admirable!' cried Challenger. "'Admirable! Not only we as individuals, but European science collectively owe you a deep debt of gratitude for what you have done. I do not hesitate to say that the disappearance of Professor Summerlee and myself would have left an appreciable gap in modern zoological history. 
Our young friend here and you have done most excellently well. He beamed at us with the old paternal smile, but European science would have been somewhat amazed could they have seen their chosen child, the hope of the future, with his tangled, unkempt head, his bare chest, and his tattered clothes. He had one of the meat tins between his knees, and sat with a large piece of cold Australian mutton between his fingers. The Indian looked up at him, and then with a little yelp, cringed to the ground, and clung to Lord John's leg. "'Don't you be scared, my bonny boy,' said Lord John, patting the matted head in front of him. "'He can't stick your appearance, Challenger, and by George I don't wonder. All right, little chap, he's only a human, just the same as the rest of us.' "'Really, sir,' cried the professor. "'Well, it's lucky for you, Challenger, that you are a little out of the ordinary, if you hadn't been so like the king. Upon my word, Lord John, you allow yourself great latitude. Well, it's a fact. I beg, sir, that you will change the subject. Your remarks are irrelevant and unintelligible. The question before us is what are we to do with these Indians? The obvious thing is to escort them home, if we knew where their home was. There is no difficulty about that, said I. They live in the caves on the other side of the central lake. Our young friend here knows where they live. I gather that it is some distance. A good twenty miles, said I. Summerlee gave a groan. I, for one, could never get there. Surely I hear those brutes still howling upon our track. As he spoke, from the dark recesses of the woods we heard far away the jabbering cry of the ape-men. The Indians once more set up a feeble wail of fear. "'We must move, and move quick,' said Lord John. "'You help Summerlee, young fellow. These Indians will carry stores. Now then, come along before they can see us.' In less than half an hour we had reached our brushwood retreat, and concealed ourselves. All day we heard the excited calling of the ape-men in the direction of our old camp, but none of them came our way and the tired fugitives, red and white, had a long, deep sleep. I was dozing myself in the evening when someone plucked my sleeve, and I found Challenger kneeling beside me. "'You keep a diary of these events, and you expect eventually to publish it, Mr. Malone,' said he with solemnity. "'I am only here as a press reporter,' I answered. "'Exactly.' You may have heard some rather fatuous remarks of Lord John Roxton's, which seemed to imply that there was some... some resemblance. Yes, I heard them. I need not say that any publicity given to such an idea, any levity in your narrative of what occurred, would be exceedingly offensive to me. I will keep well within the truth. Lord John's observations are frequently exceedingly fanciful, and he is capable of attributing the most absurd reasons to the respect which is already shown by the most undeveloped races to dignity and character. You follow my meaning? Entirely. I'll leave the matter to your discretion. Then, after a long pause, he added, The king of the ape-men was really a creature of great distinction a most remarkably handsome and intelligent personality. Did it not strike you? A most remarkable creature, said I. And the professor, much eased in his mind, settled down to his slumber once more. End of chapter The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Chapter 14 those were the real conquests. We had imagined that our pursuers, the ape-men, knew nothing of our brushwood hiding-place, but we were soon to find out our mistake. There was no sound in the woods, not a leaf moved upon the trees, and all was peace around us, but we should have been warned by our first experience how cunningly and how patiently these creatures can watch and wait until their chance comes. Whatever fate may be mine through life, I am very sure that I shall never be nearer death than I was that morning. But I will tell you the thing in its due order. 
we all awoke exhausted after the terrific emotions and scanty food of yesterday. Summerlee was still so weak that it was an effort for him to stand, but the old man was full of a sort of surly courage which would never admit defeat. A council was held, and it was agreed that we should wait quietly for an hour or two where we were, have our much-needed breakfast, and then make our way across the plateau and round the central lake to the caves where my observations had shown that the Indians lived. We relied upon the fact that we could count upon the good word of those whom we had rescued to ensure a warm welcome from their fellows. Then, with our mission accomplished and possessing a fuller knowledge of the secrets of Maple White Land, we should turn our whole thoughts to the vital problem of our escape and return. Even Challenger was ready to admit that we should then have done all for which we had come, and that our first duty from that time onwards was to carry back to civilization the amazing discoveries we had made. We were able now to take a more leisurely view of the Indians whom we had rescued. They were small men, wiry, active, and well-built, with lank black hair tied up in a bunch behind their heads with a leathern thong, and leathern also were their loincloths. Their faces were hairless, well-formed, and good-humoured. The lobes of their ears, hanging ragged and bloody, showed that they had been pierced for some ornaments which their captors had torn out. Their speech, though unintelligible to us, was fluent among themselves, and as they pointed to each other and uttered the word, Akala, many times over, we gathered that this was the name of the nation. Occasionally, with faces which were convulsed with fear and hatred, they shook their clenched hands at the woods round and cried, Doda! Doda! which was surely their term for their enemies. "'What do you make of them, Challenger?' asked Lord John. "'One thing is very clear to me, and that is that the little chap with the front of his head shaved is a chief among them.' It was indeed evident that this man stood apart from the others, and that they never ventured to address him without every sign of deep respect. He seemed to be the youngest of them all, and yet so proud and high was his spirit that, upon Challenger laying his great hand upon his head, he started like a spurred horse and, with a quick flash of his dark eyes, moved farther away from the professor. Then, placing his hand upon his breast and holding himself with great dignity, he uttered the word Maretas several times. The professor, unabashed, seized the nearest Indian by the shoulder, and proceeded to lecture upon him as if he were a potted specimen in a classroom. "'The type of these people,' said he in a sonorous fashion, "'whether judged by cranial capacity, facial angle, or any other test, cannot be regarded as a low one. On the contrary, we must place it as considerably higher in the scale than many South American tribes which I can mention.' On no possible supposition can we explain the evolution of such a race in this place. For that matter, so great a gap separates these ape-men from the primitive animals which have survived upon this plateau, that it is inadmissible to think that they could have developed where we find them. "'Then where the deuce did they drop from?' asked Lord John. "'A question which will, no doubt, be eagerly discussed in every scientific society in Europe and America.' the professor answered. My own reading of the situation, for what it is worth. He inflated his chest enormously, and looked insolently around him at the words. Is that evolution has advanced under the peculiar conditions of this country, up to the vertebrate stage, the old types surviving and living on in company with the newer ones. Thus we find such modern creatures as the tapir, an animal with quite a respectable length of pedigree the great deer, and the anteater in the companionship of reptilian forms of Jurassic type. So much is clear. And now come the ape-man and the Indian. What is the scientific mind to think of their presence? I can only account for it by an invasion from outside. It is probable that there existed an anthropoid ape in South America, who in past ages found his way to this place and that he developed into the creatures we have seen, some of which, here he looked hard at me, were of an appearance and shape which, 
if it had been accompanied by corresponding intelligence, would, I do not hesitate to say, have reflected credit upon any living race. As to the Indians, I cannot doubt that they are more recent immigrants from below. Under the stress of famine or of conquest, they have made their way up here, faced by ferocious creatures which they had never before seen, they took refuge in the caves which our young friend has described, but they have no doubt had a bitter fight to hold their own against wild beasts, and especially against the ape-men who would regard them as intruders, and wage a merciless war upon them with a cunning which the larger beasts would lack. Hence the fact that their numbers appear to be limited. Well, gentlemen, have I read you the riddle aright, or is there any point which you would query? Professor Summerlee for once was too depressed to argue, though he shook his head violently as a token of general disagreement. Lord John merely scratched his scanty locks with the remark that he couldn't put up a fight as he wasn't in the same weight or class. For my own part I performed my usual role of bringing things down to a strictly prosaic and practical level by the remark that one of the Indians was missing. "'He has gone to fetch some water,' said Lord Roxton. We fitted him up with an empty beef-tin, and he is off. "'To the old camp?' I asked. "'No, to the brook. It's among the trees there. It can't be more than a couple of hundred yards. But the beggar is certainly taking his time.' "'I'll go and look after him,' said I. I picked up my rifle and strolled in the direction of the brook, leaving my friends to lay out the scanty breakfast. It may seem to you rash that even for so short a distance I should quit the shelter of our friendly thicket, but you will remember that we were many miles from Ape Town, that so far as we knew the creatures had not discovered our retreat, and that in any case with a rifle in my hands I had no fear of them. I had not yet learned their cunning or their strength. I could hear the murmur of our brook somewhere ahead of me, but there was a tangle of trees and brushwood between me and it. I was making my way through this at a point which was just out of sight of my companions, when under one of the trees I noticed something red huddled among the bushes. As I approached it I was shocked to see that it was the dead body of the missing Indian. He lay upon his side, his limbs drawn up, and his head screwed round at a most unnatural angle, so that he seemed to be looking straight over his own shoulder. I gave a cry to warn my friends that something was amiss and running forwards I stooped over the body. Surely my guardian angel was very near me then, for some instinct of fear, or it may have been some faint rustle of leaves, made me glance upwards. Out of the thick green foliage which hung low over my head, two long muscular arms covered with reddish hair were slowly descending. Another instant, and the great stealthy hands would have been round my throat. I sprang backwards, but quick as I was, those hands were quicker still. Through my sudden spring they missed a fatal grip, but one of them caught the back of my neck and the other one my face. I threw my hands up to protect my throat, and the next moment the huge paw had slid down my face and closed over them. I was lifted lightly from the ground, and I felt an intolerable pressure forcing my head back and back, until the strain upon the cervical spine was more than I could bear. My senses swam, but I still tore at the hand and forced it out from my chin. Looking up I saw a frightful face with cold, inexorable light-blue eyes looking down into mine. There was something hypnotic in those terrible eyes. I could struggle no longer. As the creature felt me grow limp in his grasp, two white canines gleamed for a moment at each side of the vile mouth, and the grip tightened still more upon my chin forcing it always upwards and back. A thin, oval-tinted mist formed before my eyes, and little silvery bells tinkled in my ears. Dully and far off I heard the crack of a rifle, and was feebly aware of the shock as I was dropped to the earth, where I lay without sense or motion. I awoke to find myself on my back upon the grass in our lair within the thicket. Someone had brought the water from the brook, and Lord John was sprinkling my head with it, while Challenger and Summerlee were propping me up, with concern in their faces. For a moment I had a glimpse of the human spirits behind their scientific masks. 
it was really shock, rather than any injury, which had prostrated me, and in half an hour, in spite of aching head and stiff neck, I was sitting up and ready for anything. "'But you've had the escape of your life, young fellow, my lad,' said Lord Roxton. "'When I heard your cry and ran forward, and saw your head twisted half off and your stowersers kicking in the air, I thought we were one short. I missed the beast in my flurry, but he dropped you all right and was off like a streak. By George! I wish I had fifty men with rifles. I'd clear out the whole infernal gang of them, and leave this country a bit cleaner than we found it." It was clear now that the ape-men had in some way marked us down, and that we were watched on every side. We had not so much to fear from them during the day, but they would be very likely to rush us by night. So the sooner we got away from their neighbourhood, the better. On three sides of us was absolute forest, and there we might find ourselves in an ambush. But on the fourth side, that which sloped down in the direction of the lake, there was only low scrub, with scattered trees and occasional open glades. It was, in fact, the route which I had myself taken in my solitary journey, and it led us straight for the Indian caves. This, then, must for every reason be our road. One great regret we had, and that was to leave our old camp behind us, not only for the sake of the stores which remained there, but even more because we were losing touch with Zambo, our link with the outside world. However, we had a fair supply of cartridges and all our guns, so for a time at least we could look after ourselves, and we hoped soon to have a chance of returning and restoring our communications with our negro. He had faithfully promised to stay where he was, and we had not a doubt that he would be as good as his word. It was in the early afternoon that we started upon our journey. The young chief walked at our head as our guide, but refused indignantly to carry any burden. Behind him came the two surviving Indians with our scanty possessions upon their backs. We four white men walked in the rear with rifles loaded and ready. As we started there broke from the thick silent woods behind us a sudden great ululation of the ape-men, which may have been a cheer of triumph at our departure, or a jeer of contempt at our flight. Looking back we saw only the dense screen of trees, but that long-drawn yell told us how many of our enemies lurked among them. We saw no signs of pursuit, however, and soon we had got into more open country and beyond their power. As I tramped along the rearmost of the four, I could not help smiling at the appearance of my three companions in front. Was this the luxurious Lord John Roxton who had sat that evening in the Albany amidst his Persian rugs and his pictures in the pink radiance of the tinted lights? And was this the imposing professor who had swelled behind the great desk in his massive study at Enmore Park? And finally, could this be the austere and prim figure which had risen before the meeting at the Zoological Institute? No three tramps that one could have met in a Surrey Lane could have looked more hopeless and bedraggled. We had, it is true, been only a week or so upon the top of the plateau, but all our spare clothing was in our camp below, and the one week had been a severe one upon us all, though least to me who had not to endure the handling of the ape-men. My three friends had all lost their hats, and had now bound handkerchiefs round their heads. Their clothes hung in ribbons about them, and their unshaven, grimy faces were hardly to be recognized. Both Summerlee and Challenger were limping heavily, while I still dragged my feet from weakness after the shock of the morning, and my neck was as stiff as a board from the murderous grip that held it. We were indeed a sorry crew and I did not wonder to see our Indian companions glance back at us occasionally with horror and amazement on their faces. In the late afternoon we reached the margin of the lake, and as we emerged from the brush and saw the sheet of water stretching before us, our native friends set up a shrill cry of joy and pointed eagerly in front of them. It was indeed a wonderful sight which lay before us. Sweeping over the glassy surface was a great flotilla of canoes coming straight for the shore upon which we stood. They were some miles out when we first saw them, but they shot forward with great swiftness, and were soon so near that the rowers could distinguish our persons. 
instantly a thunderous shout of delight burst from them, and we saw them rise from their seats, waving their paddles and spears madly in the air. Then, bending to their work once more, they flew across the intervening water, beached their boats upon the sloping sand, and rushed up to us, prostrating themselves with loud cries of greeting before the young chief. Finally one of them, an elderly man, with a necklace and bracelets of great lustrous glass beads, and the skin of some beautiful mottled amber-coloured animal slung over his shoulders, ran forward and embraced most tenderly the youth whom we had saved. He then looked at us, and asked some questions, after which he stepped up with much dignity and embraced us also, each in turn. Then, at his order, the whole tribe lay down upon the ground before us in homage. Personally I felt shy and uncomfortable at this obsequious adoration, and I read the same feeling in the faces of Roxton and Summerlee, but Challenger expanded like a flower in the sun. "'They may be undeveloped types,' said he, stroking his beard and looking round at them, "'but their deportment in the presence of their superiors might be a lesson to some of our more advanced Europeans. Strange how correct are the instincts of the natural man!' It was clear that the natives had come out upon the warpath, for every man carried his spear, a long bamboo tipped with bone, his bow and arrows, and some sort of club or stone battle-axe slung at his side. Their dark, angry glances at the woods from which we had come, and the frequent repetition of the word Doda, made it clear enough that this was a rescue party who had set forth to save or revenge the old chief's son for such we gathered that the youth must be. A council was now held by the whole tribe squatting in a circle, whilst we sat near on a slab of basalt and watched their proceedings. Two or three warriors spoke, and finally our young friend made a spirited harangue with such eloquent features and gestures that we could understand it all as clearly as if we had known his language. "'What is the use of returning?' he said. "'Sooner or later the thing must be done.' Your comrades have been murdered. What if I have returned safe? These others have been done to death. There is no safety for any of us. We are assembled now and ready. Then he pointed to us. These strange men are our friends. They are great fighters, and they hate the ape-men even as we do. They command, here he pointed up to heaven, the thunder and the lightning. When shall we have such a chance again? Let us go forward, and either die now, or live for the future in safety. How else shall we go back unashamed to our women?" The little red warriors hung upon the words of the speaker, and when he had finished they burst into a roar of applause, waving their rude weapons in the air. The old chief stepped forward to us, and asked us some questions, pointing at the same time to the woods. Lord John made a sign to him that he should wait for an answer, and then he turned to us. "'Well, it's up to you to say what you will do,' said he. "'For my part, I have a score to settle with these monkey-folk, and if it ends by wiping them off the face of the earth, I don't see that the earth need fret about it. I'm going with our little red pals, and I mean to see them through the scrap. What do you say, young fella? "'Of course I will come.' And you, Challenger? I will assuredly cooperate. And you, Summerlee? We seem to be drifting very far from the object of this expedition, Lord John. I assure you that I little thought when I left my professional chair in London that it was for the purpose of heading a raid of savages upon a colony of anthropoid apes. To such base uses do we come, said Lord John, smiling but we are up against it. So what's the decision?" "'It seems a most questionable step,' said Summerlee, argumentative to the last. "'But if you are all going, I hardly see how I can remain behind.' "'Then it is settled,' said Lord John, and turning to the chief he nodded and slapped his rifle. The old fellow clasped our hands, each in turn, while his men cheered louder than ever. It was too late to advance that night, so the Indians settled down into a rude bivouac. On all sides their fires began to glimmer and smoke. 
Some of them who had disappeared into the jungle came back presently, driving a young iguanodon before them. Like the others, it had a daub of asphalt upon its shoulder, and it was only when we saw one of the natives step forward with the air of an owner, and give his consent to the beast's slaughter, that we understood at last that these great creatures were as much private property as a herd of cattle, and that these symbols which had so perplexed us were nothing more than the marks of the owner. Helpless, torpid, and vegetarian, with great limbs but a minute brain, they could be rounded up and driven by a child. In a few minutes the huge beast had been cut up, and slabs of him were hanging over a dozen campfires, together with great scaly ganoid fish which had been speared in the lake. Summerlee had lain down and slept upon the sand, but we others roamed round the edge of the water, seeking to learn something more of this strange country. Twice we found pits of blue clay, such as we had already seen in the swamp of the pterodactyls. These were old volcanic vents, and for some reason excited the greatest interest in Lord John. What attracted Challenger, on the other hand, was a bubbling, gurgling mud-geyser, where some strange gas formed great bursting bubbles upon the surface. He thrust a hollow reed into it, and cried out with delight like a schoolboy when he was able, on touching it with a lighted match, to cause a sharp explosion and a blue flame at the far end of the tube. Still more pleased was he when, inverting a leathern pouch over the end of the reed, and so filling it with the gas, he was able to send it soaring up into the air. "'An inflammable gas, and one markedly lighter than the atmosphere. I should say beyond doubt that it contained a considerable proportion of free hydrogen. The resources of G.E.C. are not yet exhausted, my young friend. I may yet show you how a great mind moulds all nature to its use.' He swelled with some secret purpose, but would say no more. There was nothing which we could see upon the shore which seemed to me so wonderful as the great sheet of water before us. Our numbers and our noise had frightened all living creatures away, and save for a few pterodactyls, which soared round high above our heads while they waited for the carrion, all was still around the camp. But it was different out upon the rose-tinted waters of the central lake. It boiled and heaved with strange life. Great slate-colored backs and high serrated dorsal fins shot up with a fringe of silver, and then rolled down into the depths again. The sandbanks far out were spotted with uncouth crawling forms, huge turtles, strange saurians, and one great flat creature like a writhing, palpitating mat of black greasy leather, which flopped its way slowly to the lake. Here and there high serpent heads projected out of the water, cutting swiftly through it with a little collar of foam in front, and a long, swirling wake behind, rising and falling in graceful, swan-like undulations as they went. It was not until one of these creatures wriggled on to a sandbank within a few hundred yards of us, and exposed a barrel-shaped body and huge flippers behind the long serpent neck, that Challenger and Summerlee, who had joined us, broke out into their duet of wonder and admiration. Plesiosaurus, a freshwater plesiosaurus, cried Summerlee, that I should have lived to see such a sight. We are blessed, my dear challenger, above all zoologists since the world began. It was not until the night had fallen, and the fires of our savage allies glowed red in the shadows, that our two men of science could be dragged away from the fascination of that primeval lake. Even in the darkness as we lay upon the strand, we heard from time to time the snort and plunge of the huge creatures who lived therein. At earliest dawn our camp was astir, and an hour later we had started upon our memorable expedition. Often in my dreams have I thought that I might live to be a war correspondent. In what wildest one could I have conceived the nature of the campaign which it should be my lot to report? Here, then, is my first dispatch from a field of battle. Our numbers have been reinforced during the night by a fresh batch of natives from the caves, and we may have been four or five hundred strong when we made our advance. A fringe of scouts was thrown out in front, and behind them the whole force in a solid column made their way up the long slope of the bush country, 
until we were near the edge of the forest. Here they spread out into a long straggling line of spearmen and bowmen. Roxton and Summerlee took their position upon the right flank, while Challenger and I were on the left. It was a host of the Stone Age that we were accompanying to battle, we with the last word of the gunsmith's art from St. James's Street and the Strand. We had not long to wait for our enemy. A wild shrill clamour rose from the edge of the wood, and suddenly a body of ape men rushed out with clubs and stones, and made for the centre of the Indian line. It was a valiant move, but a foolish one, for the great bandy-legged creatures were slow of foot, while their opponents were as active as cats. It was horrible to see the fierce brutes with foaming mouths and glaring eyes, rushing and grasping but forever missing their elusive enemies, while arrow after arrow buried itself in their hides. One great fellow ran past me, roaring with pain, with a dozen darts sticking from his chest and ribs. In mercy I put a bullet through his skull, and he fell sprawling among the aloes. But this was the only shot fired, for the attack had been on the centre of the line, and the Indians there had needed no help of ours in repulsing it. Of all the eight men who had rushed out into the open, I do not think that one got back to cover. But the matter was more deadly when we came among the trees, for an hour or more after we entered the wood there was a desperate struggle in which for a time we hardly held our own. Springing out from among the scrub, the eight men with huge clubs broke in upon the Indians, and often felled three or four of them before they could be speared. Their frightful blows shattered everything upon which they fell. One of them knocked Summerlee's rifle to matchwood, and the next would have crushed his skull had an Indian not stabbed the beast to the heart. Other ape-men in the trees above us hurled down stones and logs of wood, occasionally dropping bodily on to our ranks and fighting furiously until they were felled. Once our allies broke under the pressure, and had it not been for the execution done by our rifles, they would certainly have taken to their heels. But they were gallantly rallied by their old chief, and came on with such a rush that the ape-men began in turn to give way. Summerlee was weaponless, but I was emptying my magazine as quick as I could fire, and on the further flank we heard the continuous cracking of our companions' rifles. Then in a moment came the panic and the collapse. Screaming and howling, the great creatures rushed away in all directions through the brushwood, while our allies yelled in their savage delight, following swiftly after their flying enemies. All the feuds of countless generations, all the hatreds and cruelties of their narrow history, all the memories of ill-usage and persecution were to be purged that day. At last man was to be supreme, and the man-beast to find forever his allotted place. Fly as they would, the fugitives were too slow to escape from the active savages, and from every side in the tangled woods we heard the exultant yells, the twanging of bows, and the crash and thud as eight men were brought down from their hiding places in the trees. I was following the others when I found that Lord John and Challenger had come across to join us. "'It's over,' said Lord John. "'I think we can leave the tidying up to them. Perhaps the less we see of it the better we shall sleep.' Challenger's eyes were shining with the lust of slaughter. "'We have been privileged,' he cried, strutting about like a gamecock, "'to be present at one of the typical decisive battles of history, "'the battles which have determined the fate of the world. "'What, my friends, is the conquest of one nation by another? "'It is meaningless. "'Each produces the same result. "'But those fierce fights, "'when in the dawn of the ages the cave-dwellers "'held their own against the tiger-folk, "'or the elephants first found that they had a master,' Those were the real conquests, the victories that count. By this strange turn of fate we have seen and helped to decide even such a contest. Now upon this plateau the future must ever be for man. It needed a robust faith in the end to justify such tragic means. As we advanced together through the woods we found the ape-men lying thick, transfixed with spears or arrows. Here and there a little group of shattered Indians, marked where one of the anthropoids had turned to bay, and sold his life dearly. 
Always in front of us we heard the yelling and roaring which showed the direction of the pursuit. The ape men had been driven back to their city. They had made a last stand there. Once again they had been broken, and now we were in time to see the final fearful scene of all. Some eighty or a hundred males, the last survivors, had been driven across that same little clearing which led to the edge of the cliff, the scene of our own exploit two days before. As we arrived the Indians, a semicircle of spearmen, had closed in on them, and in a minute it was over. Thirty or forty died where they stood. The others, screaming and clawing, were thrust over the precipice, and went hurtling down, as their prisoners had of old, on to the sharp bamboos six hundred feet below. It was as Challenger had said, and the reign of man was assured forever in maple-white land. The males were exterminated, Ape Town was destroyed, the females and young were driven away to live in bondage, and the long rivalry of untold centuries had reached its bloody end. For us the victory brought much advantage. Once again we were able to visit our camp and get at our stores. Once more also we were able to communicate with Zambo, who had been terrified by the spectacle from afar of an avalanche of apes falling from the edge of the cliff. "'Come away, massas, come away!' he cried, his eyes starting from his head. "'The devil get you sure if you stay up there!' "'It is the voice of sanity,' said Summerlee with conviction. "'We have had adventures enough, and they are neither suitable to our character or to our position. I hold you to your word, Challenger. From now onwards you devote your energies to getting us out of this horrible country and back once more to civilization. End of chapter The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Chapter 15 Our Eyes Have Seen Great Wonders I write this from day to day, but I trust that before I come to the end of it, I may be able to say that the light shines, at last, through our clouds. We are held here with no clear means of making our escape, and bitterly we chafe against it. Yet I can well imagine that the day may come, when we may be glad that we were kept against our will, to see something more of the wonders of this singular place, and of the creatures who inhabit it. The victory of the Indians and the annihilation of the ape-men mark the turning point of our fortunes. From then onwards we were in truth masters of the plateau, for the natives looked upon us with a mixture of fear and gratitude, since by our strange powers we had aided them to destroy their hereditary foe. For their own sakes they would, perhaps, be glad to see the departure of such formidable and incalculable people, but they have not themselves suggested any way by which we may reach the plains below. There had been, so far as we could follow their signs, a tunnel by which the place could be approached, the lower exit of which we had seen from below. By this, no doubt, both ape-men and Indians had at different epochs reached the top, and Maple White with his companions had taken the same way. Only the year before, however, there had been a terrific earthquake, and the upper end of the tunnel had fallen in and completely disappeared. The Indians now could only shake their heads and shrug their shoulders when they expressed by signs our desire to descend. It may be that they cannot, but it may also be that they will not, help us to get away. At the end of the victorious campaign the surviving ape-folk were driven across the plateau, their wailings were horrible, and established in the neighborhood of the Indian caves, where they would from now onwards be a servile race under the eyes of their masters. It was a rude, raw, primeval version of the Jews in Babylon, or the Israelites in Egypt. At night we could hear from amid the trees the long-drawn cry, as some primitive Ezekiel mourned for fallen greatness, and recalled the departed glories of Ape Town. Hewers of wood and drawers of water, such were they, from now onwards. We had returned across the plateau with our allies two days after the battle, and made our camp at the foot of their cliffs. They would have had us share their caves with them, but Lord John would by no means consent to it, 
considering that to do so would put us in their power if they were treacherously disposed. We kept our independence, therefore, and had our weapons ready for any emergency, while preserving the most friendly relations. We also continually visited their caves, which were most remarkable places, though whether made by man or by nature we have never been able to determine. They were all on the one stratum, hollowed out of some soft rock which lay between the volcanic basalt forming the ruddy cliffs above them, and the hard granite which formed their base. The openings were about eighty feet above the ground, and were led up to by long stone stairs, so narrow and steep that no large animal could mount them. Inside they were warm and dry, running in straight passages of varying length into the side of the hill with smooth grey walls decorated with many excellent pictures, done with charred sticks, and representing the various animals of the plateau. If every living thing were swept from the country, the future explorer would find upon the walls of these caves ample evidence of the strange fauna, the dinosaurs, iguanodons, and fish-lizards, which had lived so recently upon earth. Since we had learned that the huge iguanodons were kept as tame herds by their owners, and were simply walking meat stores, we had conceived that man, even with his primitive weapons, had established his ascendancy upon the plateau. We were soon to discover that it was not so, and that he was still there upon tolerance. It was on the third day after our forming our camp near the Indian caves that the tragedy occurred. Challenger and Summerlee had gone off together that day to the lake, where some of the natives, under their direction, were engaged in harpooning specimens of the great lizards. Lord John and I had remained in our camp, while a number of the Indians were scattered about upon the grassy slope in front of the caves, engaged in different ways. Suddenly there was a shrill cry of alarm, with the word Stoa resounding from a hundred tongues. From every side men, women, and children were rushing wildly for shelter, swarming up the staircases and into the caves in a mad stampede. Looking up, we could see them waving their arms from the rocks above and beckoning to us to join them in their refuge. We had both seized our magazine rifles and ran out to see what the danger could be. Suddenly, from the near belt of trees, there broke forth a group of twelve or fifteen Indians, running for their lives and at their very heels two of those frightful monsters which had disturbed our camp and pursued me upon my solitary journey. In shape they were like horrible toads, and moved in a succession of springs, but in size they were of an incredible bulk, larger than the largest elephant. We had never before seen them, save at night, and indeed they are nocturnal animals, save when disturbed in their lairs, as these had been. We now stood amazed at the sight, for their blotched and warty skins were of a curious fish-like iridescence, and the sunlight struck them with an ever-varying rainbow bloom as they moved. We had little time to watch them, however, for in an instant they had overtaken the fugitives and were making a dire slaughter among them. Their method was to fall forward with their full weight upon each in turn, leaving him crushed and mangled to bound on after the others. The wretched Indians screamed with terror, but were helpless, run as they would, before the relentless purpose and horrible activity of these monstrous creatures. One after another they went down, and there was not half a dozen surviving by the time my companion and I could come to their help. But our aid was of little avail, and only involved us in the same peril. At the range of a couple of hundred yards we emptied our magazines, firing bullet after bullet into the beasts, but with no more effect than if we were pelting them with pellets of paper. Their slow reptilian natures cared nothing for wounds, and the springs of their lives, with no special brain center but scattered throughout their spinal cords, could not be tapped by any modern weapons. The most that we could do was to check their progress by distracting their attention with the flash and roar of our guns, and so to give both the natives and ourselves time to reach the steps which led to safety. But where the conical explosive bullets of the twentieth century were of no avail, 
the poisoned arrows of the natives, dipped in the juice of strophanthus and steeped afterwards in decayed carrion, could succeed. Such arrows were of little avail to the hunter who attacked the beast, because their action in that torpid circulation was slow, and before its powers failed it could certainly overtake and slay its assailant. But now, as the two monsters hounded us to the very foot of the stairs, a drift of darts came whistling from every chink in the cliff above them. In a minute they were feathered with them, and yet with no sign of pain they clawed and slobbered with impotent rage at the steps which would lead them to their victims, mounting clumsily up for a few yards, and then sliding down again to the ground. But at last the poison worked. One of them gave a deep rumbling groan and dropped his huge squat head on to the earth. The other bounded round in an eccentric circle with shrill, wailing cries, and then lying down writhed in agony for some minutes before it also stiffened and lay still. With yells of triumph the Indians came flocking down from their caves and danced a frenzied dance of victory round the dead bodies, in mad joy that two more of the most dangerous of all their enemies had been slain. That night they cut up and removed the bodies, not to eat, for the poison was still active, but lest they should breed a pestilence. The great reptilian hearts, however, each as large as a cushion, still lay there, beating slowly and steadily, with a gentle rise and fall, in horrible independent life. It was only upon the third day that the ganglia ran down and the dreadful things were still. Some day, when I have a better desk than a meat tin, and more helpful tools than a worn stub of pencil and a last tattered notebook, I will write some fuller account of the Akala Indians, of our life amongst them, and of the glimpses which we had of the strange conditions of wondrous maple-white land. Memory, at least, will never fail me, for so long as the breath of life is in me, every hour and every action of that period will stand out as hard and clear as do the first strange happenings of our childhood. No new impressions could have faced those which are so deeply cut. When the time comes I will describe that wondrous moonlit night upon the huge lake when a young Ichthyosaurus, a strange creature, half seal, half fish, to look at, with bone-covered eyes on each side of his snout, and a third eye fixed upon the top of his head, was entangled in an Indian net, and nearly upset our canoe before we towed it ashore. The same night that a green water-snake shot out from the rushes and carried off in its coils the steersman of Challenger's canoe. I will tell, too, of the great nocturnal white thing. To this day we do not know whether it was beast or reptile, which lived in a vile swamp to the east of the lake, and flitted about with a faint phosphorescent glimmer in the darkness. The Indians were so terrified at it that they would not go near the place, and though we twice made expeditions and saw it each time, we could not make our way through the deep marsh in which it lived. I can only say that it seemed to be larger than a cow, and had the strangest musky odor. I will tell also of the huge bird which chased Challenger to the shelter of the rocks one day, a great running bird, far taller than an ostrich, with a vulture-like neck and cruel head which made it a walking death. As Challenger climbed to safety, one dart of that savage curving beak shore off the heel of his boot, as if it had been cut with a chisel. This time at least modern weapons prevailed, and the great creature, twelve feet from head to foot, Fororacus, its name, according to our panting but exultant professor, went down before Lord Roxton's rifle in a flurry of waving feathers and kicking limbs, with two remorseless yellow eyes glaring up from the midst of it. May I live to see that flattened, vicious skull in its own niche among the trophies of the Albany. Finally, I will assuredly give some account of the Toxodon, the giant ten-foot guinea-pig, with projecting chisel teeth, which we killed as it drank in the grey of the morning by the side of the lake. All this I shall some day write at fuller length, and amidst these more stirring days I would tenderly sketch in these lovely summer evenings, 
when with the deep blue sky above us we lay in good comradeship among the long grasses by the wood, and marvelled at the strange fowl that swept over us, and the quaint new creatures which crept from their burrows to watch us, while above us the boughs of the bushes were heavy with luscious fruit, and below us strange and lovely flowers peeped at us from among the herbage. Or those long moonlit nights when we lay out upon the shimmering surface of the great lake, and watched with wonder and awe the huge circles rippling out from the sudden splash of some fantastic monster, or the greenish gleam, far down in the deep water, of some strange creature upon the confines of darkness. These are the scenes which my mind and my pen will dwell upon in every detail at some future day. But, you will ask, why these experiences and why this delay? when you and your comrades should have been occupied day and night in the devising of some means by which you could return to the outer world. My answer is, that there was not one of us who was not working for this end, but that our work had been in vain. One fact we had very speedily discovered. The Indians would do nothing to help us. In every other way they were our friends, one might almost say our devoted slaves, but when it was suggested that they should help us to make and carry a plank which would bridge the chasm, or when we wished to get from them thongs of leather or liana to weave ropes which might help us, we were met by a good-humoured but an invincible refusal. They would smile, twinkle their eyes, shake their heads, and there was the end of it. Even the old chief met us with the same obstinate denial, and it was only Meritas, the youngster whom we had saved, who looked wistfully at us and told us by his gestures that he was grieved for our thwarted wishes. Ever since their crowning triumph with the ape-men they looked upon us as supermen who bore victory in the tubes of strange weapons, and they believed that so long as we remained with them good fortune would be theirs. A little red-skinned wife and a cave of our own were freely offered to each of us if we would but forget our own people and dwell forever upon the plateau. So far all had been kindly, however far apart our desires might be, but we felt well assured that our actual plans of a descent must be kept secret, for we had reason to fear that at the last they might try to hold us by force. In spite of the danger from dinosaurs, which is not great save at night, for, as I may have said before, they are mostly nocturnal in their habits. I have twice in the last three weeks been over to our old camp in order to see our negro, who still kept watch and ward below the cliff. My eyes strained eagerly across the great plain in the hope of seeing afar off the help for which we had prayed. But the long, cactus-strewn levels still stretched away, empty and bare, to the distant line of the canebrake. "'They will soon come now, Massa Boulogne. Before another week pass, Indian come back, and bring rope, and fetch you down." Such was the cheery cry of our excellent Zambo. I had one strange experience as I came away from the second visit, which had involved my being away for a night from my companions. I was returning along the well-remembered route, and had reached a spot within a mile or so of the marsh of the pterodactyls, when I saw an extraordinary object approaching me. It was a man who walked inside a framework made of bent canes, so that he was enclosed on all sides in a bell-shaped cage. As I drew nearer I was more amazed still to see that it was Lord John Roxton. When he saw me he slipped from under his curious protection, and came towards me laughing, and yet, as I thought, with some confusion in his manner. "'Well, young fella," said he, "'who would have thought of meeting you up here?' "'What in the world are you doing?' I asked. "'Visiting, my friend, the pterodactyls,' said he. "'But why? Interesting beast, don't you think? But unsociable. Nasty, rude way with strangers, as you may remember. So I rigged this framework which keeps them from being too pressing in their attentions. "'But what do you want in the swamp?' He looked at me with a very questioning eye and I read hesitation in his face. "'Don't you think other people besides professors can want to know things?' he said at last. 
I'm studying the pretty dears. That's enough for you. No offence, said I. His good humour returned, and he laughed. No offence, young fella. I'm going to get a young devil chick for challenger. That's one of my jobs. No, I don't want your company. I'm safe in this cage, and you are not. So long, and I'll be back in camp by nightfall. He turned away, and I left him wandering on through the wood with his extraordinary cage around him. If Lord John's behaviour at this time was strange, that of Challenger was more so. I may say that he seemed to possess an extraordinary fascination for the Indian women, and that he always carried a large spreading palm branch with which he beat them off, as if they were flies, when their attentions became too pressing. To see him walking like a comic opera sultan, with this badge of authority in his hand, his black beard bristling in front of him, his toes pointing at each step, and a train of wide-eyed Indian girls behind him, clad in their slender drapery of bark cloth, is one of the most grotesque of all the pictures which I will carry back with me. As to Summerlee, he was absorbed in the insect and bird life of the plateau, and spent his whole time save that considerable portion which was devoted to abusing Challenger for not getting us out of our difficulties, in cleaning and mounting his specimens. Challenger had been in the habit of walking off by himself every morning, and returning from time to time with looks of portentous solemnity, as one who bears the full weight of a great enterprise upon his shoulders. One day, palm branch in hand, and his crowd of adoring devotees behind him, he led us down to his hidden workshop, and took us into the secret of his plans. The place was a small clearing in the centre of a palm grove, and this was one of those boiling mud geysers which I have already described. Around its edge were scattered a number of leathern thongs cut from iguanodon hide, and a large collapsed membrane which proved to be the dried and scraped stomach of one of the great fish lizards from the lake. This huge sack had been sewn up at one end, and only a small orifice left at the other. Into this opening several bamboo canes had been inserted, and the other ends of these canes were in contact with conical clay funnels, which collected the gas bubbling up through the mud of the geyser. Soon the flaccid organ began to slowly expand, and show a tendency to upward movements, the challenger fastened the cords, which held it to the trunks of the surrounding trees. In half an hour a good-sized gas-bag had been formed, and the jerking and straining upon the thongs showed that it was capable of considerable lift. Challenger, like a glad father in the presence of his firstborn, stood smiling and stroking his beard, in silent self-satisfied content as he gazed at the creation of his brain. It was Summerlee who first broke the silence. "'You don't mean us to go up in that thing, Challenger?' said he in an acid voice. I mean, my dear Summerlee, to give you such a demonstration of its powers that, after seeing it, you will, I am sure, have no hesitation in trusting yourself to it. You can put it right out of your head now at once, said Summerlee with decision. Nothing on earth would induce me to commit such a folly. Lord John, I trust you will not countenance such madness. Deuced ingenious, I call it said our peer. I'd like to see how it works. So you shall, said Challenger. For some days I have exerted my whole brain force upon the problem of how we shall descend from these cliffs. We have satisfied ourselves that we cannot climb down, and that there is no tunnel. We are also unable to construct any kind of bridge which may take us back to the pinnacle from which we came. How, then, shall I find a means to convey us? Some little time ago I had remarked to our young friend here that free hydrogen was evolved from the geyser. The idea of a balloon naturally followed. I was, I will admit, somewhat baffled by the difficulty of discovering an envelope to contain the gas, but the contemplation of the immense entrails of these reptiles supplied me with a solution to the problem. Behold the result! He put one hand in the front of his ragged jacket, and pointed proudly with the other. By this time the gas-bag had swollen to a goodly rotundity, and was jerking strongly upon its lashings. "'Midsummer madness!' 
snorted Summerlee. Lord John was delighted with the whole idea. "'Clever, old dear, ain't he?' he whispered to me, and then louder to Challenger. "'What about a car?' "'The car will be my next care. I have already planned how it is to be made and attached. Meanwhile I will simply show you how capable my apparatus is of supporting the weight of each of us.' "'All of us, surely?' "'No. It is part of my plan that each in turn shall descend as in a parachute, and the balloon be drawn back by means which I shall have no difficulty in perfecting. If it will support the weight of one, and let him gently down, it will have done all that is required of it. I will now show you its capacity in that direction.' He brought out a lump of basalt of a considerable size, constructed in the middle, so that a cord could be easily attached to it. This cord was the one which we had brought with us on to the plateau after we had used it for climbing the pinnacle. It was over a hundred feet long, and though it was thin it was very strong. He had prepared a sort of collar of leather with many straps depending from it. This collar was placed over the dome of the balloon, and the hanging thongs were gathered together below so that the pressure of any weight would be diffused over a considerable surface. Then the lump of basalt was fastened to the thongs, and the rope was allowed to hang from the end of it, being passed three times round the professor's arm. "'I will now,' said Challenger, with a smile of pleased anticipation, "'demonstrate the carrying power of my balloon.' As he said so, he cut with a knife the various lashings that held it. Never was our expedition in more imminent danger of complete annihilation. The inflated membrane shot up with frightful velocity into the air. In an instant Challenger was pulled off his feet and dragged after it. I had just time to throw my arms round his ascending waist when I was myself whipped up into the air. Lord John had me with a rat-track grip around the legs, but I felt that he also was coming off the ground. For a moment I had a vision of four adventurers floating like a string of sausages over the land that they had explored. But, happily, there were limits to the strain which the rope would stand, though none apparently to the lifting powers of this infernal machine. There was a sharp crack, and we were in a heap upon the ground with coils of rope all over us. When we were able to stagger to our feet, we saw far off in the deep blue sky one dark spot where the lump of basalt was speeding upon its way. "'Splendid!' cried the undaunted challenger, rubbing his injured arm. "'A most thorough and satisfactory demonstration. I could not have anticipated such a success. Within a week, gentlemen, I promise that a second balloon will be prepared, and then you can count upon taking in safety and comfort the first stage of our homeward journey.' So far I have written each of the foregoing events as it occurred. Now I am rounding off my narrative from the old camp, where Zambo has waited so long, with all our difficulties and dangers left like a dream behind us, upon the summit of those vast, ruddy crags which tower above our heads. We have descended in safety, though in a most unexpected fashion, and all is well with us. In six weeks or two months we shall be in London, and it is possible that this letter may not reach you much earlier than we do ourselves. Already our hearts yearn, and our spirits fly towards the great mother city which holds so much that is dear to us. It was on the very evening of our perilous adventure with Challenger's homemade balloon that the change came in our fortunes. I have said that the one person from whom we had had some sign of sympathy in our attempts to get away was the young chief whom we had rescued. He alone had no desire to hold us against our will in a strange land. He had told us as much by his expressive language of signs. That evening, after dusk, he came down to our little camp, handed me, for some reason he had always shown his attentions to me, perhaps because I was the one who was nearest his age, a small roll of the bark of a tree, and then pointing solemnly up at the row of caves above him, he had put his finger to his lips as a sign of secrecy, and had stolen back again to his people. I took the slip of bark to the firelight, and we examined it together. It was about a foot square, and on the inner side there was a singular arrangement of lines which I here reproduce. 
They were neatly done in charcoal upon the white surface, and looked to me at first sight like some sort of rough musical score. "'Whatever it is, I can swear that it is of importance to us,' said I. I could read that on his face as he gave it. "'Unless we have come upon a primitive practical joker,' Summerlee suggested, "'which I should think would be one of the most elementary developments of man.' "'It is clearly some sort of script,' said Challenger. "'Looks like a guinea-puzzle competition,' remarked Lord John, craning his neck to have a look at it. Then suddenly he stretched out his hand and seized the puzzle. "'By George!' he cried. "'I believe I've got it. The boy guessed right the very first time. See here. How many marks are on that paper? Eighteen. Well, if you come to think of it, there are eighteen cave openings on the hillside above us." "'He pointed up to the caves when he gave it to me,' said I. "'Well, that settles it. This is a chart of the caves. What? Eighteen of them all in a row, some short, some deep, some branching, same as we saw them. It's a map, and here's a cross on it. What's the cross for?' it is placed to mark one that is much deeper than the others. "'One that goes through!' I cried. "'I believe our young friend has read the riddle,' said Challenger. "'If the cave does not go through, I do not understand why this person, who has every reason to mean us well, should have drawn our attention to it. But if it does go through, and comes out at the corresponding point on the other side, we should not have more than a hundred feet to descend.' A hundred feet, grumbled Summerlee. Well, our rope is still more than a hundred feet long, I cried. Surely we could get down. How about the Indians in the cave? Summerlee objected. There are no Indians in any of the caves above our heads, said I. They are all used as barns and storehouses. Why should we not go up there now at once and spy out the land? There is a dry, bituminous wood upon the plateau, a species of araucaria, according to our botanist, which is always used by the Indians for torches. Each of us picked up a faggot of this, and we made our way up weed-covered steps to the particular cave which was marked in the drawing. It was, as I have said, empty, save for a great number of enormous bats, which flapped round our heads as we advanced into it. As we had no desire to draw the attention of the Indians to our proceedings, we stumbled along in the dark until we had gone round several curves, and penetrated a considerable distance into the cavern. Then at last we lit our torches. It was a beautiful dry tunnel with smooth grey walls, covered with native symbols, a curved roof which arched over our heads, and white glistening sand beneath our feet. We hurried eagerly along it until, with a deep groan of bitter disappointment, we were brought to a halt. A sheer wall of rock had appeared before us, with no chink through which a mouse could have slipped. There was no escape for us there. We stood with bitter hearts staring at this unexpected obstacle. It was not the result of any convulsion, as in the case of the ascending tunnel. The end wall was exactly like the side ones. It was, and had always been, a cul-de-sac. "'Never mind, my friends,' said the inevitable challenger. "'You still have my firm promise of a balloon.' Summerlee groaned. "'Can we be in the wrong cave?' I suggested. "'No use, young fellow," said Lord John, with his finger on the chart. Seventeen from the right, second from the left. This is the cave, sure enough.' I looked at the mark to which his finger pointed, and I gave a sudden cry of joy. I believe I have it. Follow me. Follow me. I hurried back along the way we had come, my torch in my hand. Here, said I, pointing to some matches upon the ground, is where we lit up. Exactly. Well, it is marked as a fort cave, and in the darkness we passed the fork before the torches were lit. On the right side, as we go out, we should find the longer arm. It was as I had said. We had not gone thirty yards before a great black opening loomed in the wall. 
we turned into it to find that we were in a much larger passage than before. Along it we hurried in breathless impatience for many hundreds of yards. Then suddenly, in the black darkness of the arch in front of us, we saw a gleam of dark red light. We stared in amazement. A sheet of steady flame seemed to cross the passage, and to bar our way. We hastened towards it. No sound, no heat, no movement came from it, but still the great luminous curtain glowed before us, silvering all the cave and turning the sand to powdered jewels, until as we drew closer it discovered a circular edge. "'The moon, by George!' cried Lord John. "'We are through, boys, we are through!' It was indeed the full moon which shone straight down the aperture which opened upon the cliffs. It was a small rift, not larger than a window, but it was enough for all our purposes. As we craned our necks through it we could see that the descent was not a very difficult one, and that the level ground was no very great way below us. It was no wonder that from below we had not observed the place, as the cliffs curved overhead and an ascent at that spot would have seemed so impossible as to discourage close inspection. We satisfied ourselves that with the help of our rope we could find our way down, and then returned rejoicing to our camp to make our preparations for the next evening. What we did we had to do quickly and secretly, since even at this last hour the Indians might hold us back. Our stores we would leave behind us, save only our guns and cartridges. But Challenger had some unwieldy stuff which he ardently desired to take with him, and one particular package, of which I may not speak, which gave us more labor than any. Slowly the day passed, but when the darkness fell we were ready for our departure. With much labor we got our things up the steps, and then, looking back, took one last long survey of that strange land Soon I fear to be vulgarized, the prey of hunter and prospector, but to each of us a dreamland of glamour and romance, a land where we had dared much, suffered much, and learned much, our land, as we shall ever fondly call it. Along upon our left the neighbouring caves each threw out its ruddy cheery firelight into the gloom. From the slope below us rose the voices of the Indians as they laughed and sang, Beyond was the long sweep of the woods, and in the centre, shimmering vaguely through the gloom, was the great lake, the mother of strange monsters. Even as we looked, a high wickering cry, the call of some weird animal, rang clear out of the darkness. It was the very voice of Maple White Land bidding us good-bye. We turned and plunged into the cave which led to home. Two hours later, we— our packages, and all we owned, were at the foot of the cliff. Save for Challenger's luggage we had never a difficulty. Leaving it all where we descended, we started at once for Zambo's camp. In the early morning we approached it, but only to find, to our amazement, not one fire but a dozen upon the plain. The rescue party had arrived. There were twenty Indians from the river, with stakes, ropes, and all that could be useful for bridging the chasm. At least we shall have no difficulty now in carrying our packages, when to-morrow we begin to make our way back to the Amazon. And so, in humble and thankful mood, I close this account. Our eyes have seen great wonders, and our souls are chastened by what we have endured. Each is in his own way a better and deeper man. It may be that when we reach Para we shall stop to refit. If we do, this letter will be a mail ahead. If not, it will reach London on the very day that I do. In either case, my dear Mr. McArdle, I hope very soon to shake you by the hand. End of chapter The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Chapter 16 A Procession a procession. I should wish to place upon record here our gratitude to all our friends upon the Amazon for the very great kindness and hospitality which was shown to us upon our return journey. 
Very particularly would I thank Signor Penalosa and other officials of the Brazilian government for the special arrangements by which we were helped upon our way, and Signor Pereira of Para, to whose forethought we owe the complete outfit for a decent appearance in the civilized world which we found ready for us at that town. It seemed a poor return for all the courtesy which we encountered that we should deceive our host and benefactors, but under the circumstances we had really no alternative, and I hereby tell them that they will only waste their time and their money if they attempt to follow upon our traces. Even the names have been altered in our accounts, and I am very sure that no one, from the most careful study of them, could come within a thousand miles of our unknown land. The excitement which had been caused through those parts of South America which we had to traverse was imagined by us to be purely local, and I can assure our friends in England that we had no notion of the uproar which the mere rumour of our experiences had caused through Europe. It was not until the Ivernia was within five hundred miles of Southampton that the wireless messages from paper after paper, and agency after agency, offering huge prices for a short return message as to our actual results, showed us how strained was the attention not only of the scientific world, but of the general public. It was agreed among us, however, that no definite statement should be given to the press until we had met the members of the Zoological Institute, since as delegates it was our clear duty to give our first report to the body from which we had received our commission of investigation. Thus, although we found Southampton full of pressmen, we absolutely refused to give any information, which had the natural effect of focusing public attention upon the meeting which was advertised for the evening of November 7th. For this gathering, the zoological hall which had been the scene of the inception of our task was found to be far too small, and it was only in the Queen's Hall in Regent Street that accommodation could be found. It is now common knowledge the promoters might have ventured upon the Albert Hall and still found their space too scanty. It was for the second evening after our arrival that the great meeting had been fixed. For the first we had each, no doubt, our own pressing personal affairs to absorb us. Of mine I cannot yet speak. It may be that, as it stands further from me, I may think of it, and even speak of it, with less emotion. I have shown the reader in the beginning of this narrative where lay the springs of my action. It is but right, perhaps, that I should carry on the tale and show also the results. And yet the day may come when I would not have it otherwise. At least I have been driven forth to take part in a wondrous adventure, and I cannot but be thankful to the force that drove me. And now I turn to the last supreme eventful moment of our adventure. As I was racking my brain as to how I should best describe it, my eyes fell upon the issue of my own journal for the morning of the 8th of November, with a full and excellent account of my friend and fellow reporter Macdona. What can I do better than transcribe his narrative, headlines and all? I admit that the paper was exuberant in the manner, out of compliment to its own enterprise in sending a correspondent but the other great dailies were hardly less full in their account. Thus, then, friend Mac in his report. The New World. Great meeting at the Queen's Hall. Scenes of uproar. Extraordinary incident. What was it? Nocturnal riot in Regent Street. Special. The much-discussed meeting of the Zoological Institute convened to hear the report of the Committee of Investigation sent out last year to South America, to test the assertions made by Professor Challenger as to the continued existence of prehistoric life upon that continent, was held last night in the Greater Queen's Hall, and it is safe to say that it is likely to be a red-letter date in the history of science, for the proceedings were of so remarkable and sensational a character that no one present is ever likely to forget them. Oh, Brother Scribe Macdona, what a monstrous opening sentence! The tickets were theoretically confined to members and their friends, but the latter is an elastic term, and long before eight o'clock, the hour fixed for the commencement of the proceedings, 
all parts of the great hall were tightly packed. The general public, however, which most unreasonably entertained a grievance at having been excluded, stormed the doors at a quarter to eight, after a prolonged melee in which several people were injured, including Inspector Scobel of H. Division, whose leg was unfortunately broken. After this unwarrantable invasion, which not only filled every passage, but even intruded upon the space set apart for the press, it is estimated that nearly five thousand people awaited the arrival of the travellers. When they eventually appeared, they took their places in the front of a platform which already contained all the leading scientific men, not only of this country, but of France and of Germany. Sweden was also represented, in the person of Professor Sergius, the famous zoologist of the University of Uppsala. The entrance of the four heroes of the occasion was the signal for a remarkable demonstration of welcome, the whole audience rising and cheering for some minutes. An acute observer might, however, have detected some signs of dissent amid the applause, and gathered that the proceedings were likely to become more lively than harmonious. It may safely be prophesied, however, that no one could have foreseen the extraordinary turn which they were actually to take. Of the appearance of the four wanderers little need be said, since their photographs have for some time been appearing in all the papers. They bear few traces of the hardships which they are said to have undergone. Professor Challenger's beard may be more shaggy, Professor Summerlee's features more ascetic, Lord John Roxton's figure more gaunt, and all three may be burned to a darker tint than when they left our shores, but each appeared to be in most excellent health. As to our own representative, the well-known athlete and international rugby football player, E. D. Malone, he looks trained to a hair, and as he surveyed the crowd a smile of good-humoured contentment pervaded his honest and homely face. All right, Mac, wait till I get you alone. When quiet had been restored, and the audience resumed their seats after the ovation which they had given to the travellers, the chairman, the Duke of Durham, addressed the meeting. He should not, he said, stand for more than a moment between that vast assembly and the treat which lay before them. It was not for him to anticipate what Professor Summerlee, who was the spokesman of the committee, had to say to them, but it was common rumour that their expedition had been crowned by extraordinary success. Applause. Apparently the age of romance was not dead, and there was common ground upon which the wildest imaginings of the novelist could meet the actual scientific investigations of the searcher for truth. He would only add, before he sat down, that he rejoiced, and all of them would rejoice, that these gentlemen had returned safe and sound from their difficult and dangerous task, for it cannot be denied that any disaster to such an expedition would have inflicted a well-nigh irreparable loss to the cause of zoological science. Great applause, in which Professor Challenger was observed to join. Professor Summerlee's rising was the signal for another extraordinary outbreak of enthusiasm, which broke out again at intervals throughout his address. That address will not be given in extenso in these columns, for the reason that a full account of the whole adventures of the expedition is being published as a supplement from the pen of our own special correspondent. Some general indications will therefore suffice. Having described the genesis of their journey, and paid a handsome tribute to his friend Professor Challenger, coupled with an apology for the incredulity with which his assertions, now fully vindicated, had been received, he gave the actual course of their journey, carefully withholding such information as would aid the public in any attempt to locate this remarkable plateau. Having described, in general terms, their course from the main river up to the time that they actually reached the base of the cliffs, he enthralled his hearers by his account of the difficulties encountered by the expedition in their repeated attempts to mount them, and finally described how they succeeded in their desperate endeavours, which cost the lives of their two devoted half-breed servants. 
This amazing reading of the affair was the result of Summerlee's endeavours to avoid raising any questionable matter at the meeting. Having conducted his audience in fancy to the summit, and marooned them there by reason of the fall of their bridge, the professor proceeded to describe both the horrors and the attractions of that remarkable land. Of personal adventures he said little, but laid stress upon the rich harvest reaped by science, in the observations of the wonderful beast, bird, insect, and plant life of the plateau. Peculiarly rich in the coleoptera and in the lepidoptera, forty-six new species of the one and ninety-four of the other had been secured in the course of a few weeks. It was, however, in the larger animals, and especially in the larger animals supposed to have been long extinct, that the interest of the public was naturally centred. Of these he was able to give a goodly list, but had little doubt that it would be largely extended when the place had been more thoroughly investigated. He and his companions had seen at least a dozen creatures, most of them at a distance, which corresponded with nothing at present known to science. These would in time be duly classified and examined. He instanced a snake, the cast skin of which, deep purple in color, was fifty-one feet in length, and mentioned a white creature, supposed to be mammalian, which gave forth well-marked phosphorescence in the darkness, also a large black moth, the bite of which was supposed by the Indians to be highly poisonous. Setting aside these entirely new forms of life, the plateau was very rich in known prehistoric forms, dating back in some cases to early Jurassic times. Among these he mentioned the gigantic and grotesque Stegosaurus, seen once by Mr. Malone at a drinking-place by the lake, and drawn in the sketch-book of that adventurous American who had first penetrated this unknown world. He described also the Iguanodon and the Pterodactyl, two of the first of the wonders which they had encountered. He then thrilled the assembly by some account of the terrible carnivorous dinosaurs, which had on more than one occasion pursued members of the party, and which were the most formidable of all the creatures which they had encountered. Thence he passed to the huge and ferocious bird, the Phororachus, and to the great elk which still roams upon this upland. It was not, however, until he sketched the mysteries of the central lake that the full interest and enthusiasm of the audience were aroused. One had to pinch oneself to be sure that one was awake, as one heard this sane and practical professor, in cold measured tones, describing the monstrous three-eyed fish-lizards and the huge water-snakes which inhabit this enchanted sheet of water. Next he touched upon the Indians and upon the extraordinary colony of anthropoid apes, which might be looked upon as an advance upon the Pithecanthropus of Java, and as coming therefore nearer than any known form to that hypothetical creation, the missing link. Finally he described, amidst some merriment, the ingenious but highly dangerous aeronautic invention of Professor Challenger, and wound up a most memorable address by an account of the methods by which the committee did at last find their way back to civilization. It had been hoped that the proceedings would end there, and that a vote of thanks and congratulation, moved by Professor Sergius of Uppsala University, would be duly seconded and carried. But it was soon evident that the course of events was not destined to flow so smoothly. Symptoms of opposition had been evident from time to time during the evening, and now Dr. James Illingworth of Edinburgh rose in the centre of the hall. Dr. Illingworth asked whether an amendment should not be taken before a resolution. The Chairman. Yes, sir, if there must be an amendment. Dr. Illingworth. Your Grace, there must be an amendment. The Chairman. Then let us take it at once. Professor Summerlee, springing to his feet. Might I explain, Your Grace, that this man is my personal enemy, ever since our controversy in the Quarterly Journal of Science, as to the true nature of Bathybius? The Chairman. I fear I cannot go into personal matters. Proceed. 
Dr. Illingworth was imperfectly heard in part of his remarks on account of the strenuous opposition of the friends of the explorers. Some attempts were also made to pull him down. Being a man of enormous physique, however, and possessed of a very powerful voice, he dominated the tumult and succeeded in finishing his speech. It was clear, from the moment of his rising, that he had a number of friends and sympathizers in the hall, though they formed a minority in the audience. The attitude of the greater part of the public must be described as one of attentive neutrality. Dr. Illingworth began his remarks by expressing his high appreciation of the scientific work both of Professor Challenger and of Professor Summerlee. He much regretted that any personal bias should have been read into his remarks, which were entirely dictated by his desire for scientific truth. His position, in fact, was substantially the same as that taken up by Professor Summerlee at the last meeting. At that last meeting Professor Challenger had made certain assertions, which had been queried by his colleague. Now this colleague came forward himself with the same assertions, and expected them to remain unquestioned. Was this reasonable? Yes, no, and prolonged interruption, during which Professor Challenger was heard from the press-box to ask leave from the chairman to put Dr. Illingworth into the street. A year ago one man said certain things. Now four men said other and more startling ones. Was this to constitute a final proof where the matters in question were of the most revolutionary and incredible character? There had been recent examples of travellers arriving from the unknown with certain tales which had been too readily accepted. Was the London Zoological Institute to place itself in this position? He admitted that the members of the committee were men of character, but human nature was very complex. Even professors might be misled by the desire for notoriety. Like moths, we all love best to flutter in the light. Heavy game-shots liked to be in a position to cap the tales of their rivals, and journalists were not averse from sensational coups, even when imagination had to aid fact in the process. Each member of the committee had his own motive for making the most of his results. Shame! Shame! He had no desire to be offensive. You are an interruption. The corroboration of these wondrous tales was readily of the most slender description. What did it amount to? Some photographs. Was it possible that in this age of ingenious manipulation photographs could be accepted as evidence? What more? We have a story of a flight and a descent by ropes which precluded the production of larger specimens. It was ingenious, but not convincing. It was understood that Lord John Roxton claimed to have the skull of a Phororacus. He could only say that he would like to see that skull. Lord John Roxton. Is this fellow calling me a liar? Uproar. The chairman. Order! Order! Dr. Illingworth, I must direct you to bring your remarks to a conclusion and to move your amendment. Dr. Illingworth. Your Grace, I have more to say, but I bow to your ruling. I move, then, that while Professor Summerlee be thanked for his interesting address, the whole matter shall be regarded as non-proven, and shall be referred back to a larger and possibly more reliable committee of investigation. It is difficult to describe the confusion caused by this amendment. A large section of the audience expressed their indignation at such a slur upon the travellers by noisy shouts of dissent and cries of, "'Don't put it! Withdraw! Turn him out!' On the other hand, the malcontents, and it cannot be denied that they were fairly numerous, cheered for the amendment with cries of, "'Order! Chair! And fair play!' A scuffle broke out in the back benches, and blows were freely exchanged among the medical students who crowded that part of the hall. It was only the moderating influence of the presence of large numbers of ladies which prevented an absolute riot. Suddenly, however, there was a pause, a hush, and then complete silence. Professor Challenger was on his feet. His appearance and manner are peculiarly arresting and as he raised his hand for order, the whole audience settled down expectantly to give him a hearing. "'It will be within the recollection of many present,' said Professor Challenger, 
that similar foolish and unmannerly scenes marked the last meeting at which I had been able to address them. On that occasion Professor Summerlee was the chief offender, and though he is now chastened and contrite, the matter could not be entirely forgotten. I have heard to-night similar, but even more offensive, sentiments from the person who has just sat down, and though it is a conscious effort of self-effacement to come down to that person's mental level, I will endeavour to do so, in order to allay any reasonable doubt which could possibly exist in the minds of any one. Laughter and interruption. I need not remind this audience that, although Professor Summerlee, as the head of the Committee of Investigation, has been put up to speak to-night, still it is I who am the real prime mover in this business, and that it is mainly to me that any successful result must be ascribed. I have safely conducted these three gentlemen to the spot mentioned, and I have, as you have heard, convinced them of the accuracy of my previous account. We had hoped that we should find upon our return that no one was so dense as to dispute our joint conclusions. Warned, however, by my previous experience, I have not come without such proofs as may convince a reasonable man. As explained by Professor Summerlee, our cameras have been tampered with by the ape-men when they ransacked our camp, and most of our negatives ruined. Jeers, laughter, and tell us another from the back. I have mentioned the ape-men, and I cannot forbear from saying that some of the sounds which now meet my ears bring back most vividly to my recollection my experiences with those interesting creatures. Laughter. In spite of the destruction of so many invaluable negatives, there still remains in our collection a certain number of corroborative photographs showing the conditions of life upon the plateau. Did they accuse them of having forged these photographs? A voice, yes, and considerable interruption, which ended in several men being put out of the hall. The negatives were open to the inspection of experts. But what other evidence had they? Under the conditions of their escape it was naturally impossible to bring a large amount of baggage, but they had rescued Professor Summerlee's collections of butterflies and beetles, containing many new species. Was this not evidence? Several voices. No. Who said no? Dr. Illingworth, rising. Our point is that such a collection might have been made in other places than a prehistoric plateau. Applause. Professor Challenger. No doubt, sir, we have to bow to your scientific authority, though I must admit that the name is unfamiliar. Passing, then, both the photographs and the entomological collection, I come to the varied and accurate information which we bring with us upon points which have never before been elucidated. For example, upon the domestic habits of the pterodactyl, a voice, bosh, an uproar. I say that upon the domestic habits of the pterodactyl we can throw a flood of light. I can exhibit to you from my portfolio a picture of that creature taken from life which would convince you. Dr. Illingworth, no picture could convince us of anything. Professor Challenger. You would require to see the thing itself? Dr. Illingworth. Undoubtedly. Professor Challenger. And you would accept that? Dr. Illingworth, laughing. Beyond a doubt. It was at this point that the sensation of the evening arose, a sensation so dramatic that it can never have been paralleled in the history of scientific gatherings. Professor Challenger raised his hand in the air as a signal and at once our colleague, Mr. E. D. Malone, was observed to rise and to make his way to the back of the platform. An instant later he reappeared in company of a gigantic negro, the two of them bearing between them a large square packing-case. It was evidently of great weight, and was slowly carried forward and placed in front of the professor's chair. All sound had hushed in the audience, and every one was absorbed in the spectacle before them. Professor Challenger drew off the top of the case, which formed a sliding lid. Peering down into the box he snapped his fingers several times, and was heard from the press seat to say, "'Come, then, pretty, pretty. 
in a coaxing voice. An instant later, with a scratching, rattling sound, a most horrible and loathsome creature appeared from below and perched itself upon the side of the case. Even the unexpected fall of the Duke of Durham into the orchestra, which occurred at this moment, could not distract the petrified attention of the vast audience. The face of the creature was like the wildest gargoyle that the imagination of a mad medieval builder could have conceived. It was malicious, horrible, with two small red eyes as bright as points of burning coal. Its long, savage mouth, which was held half open, was full of a double row of shark-like teeth. Its shoulders were humped, and round them were draped what appeared to be a faded grey shawl. It was the devil of our childhood, in person. There was a turmoil in the audience. Someone screamed. Two ladies in the front row fell senseless from their chairs, and there was a general movement upon the platform to follow the chairman into the orchestra. For a moment there was danger of a general panic. Professor Challenger threw up his hands to still the commotion, but the movement alarmed the creature beside him. Its strange shawl suddenly unfurled, spread and fluttered as a pair of leathery wings. Its owner grabbed at its legs, but too late to hold it. It had sprung from the perch and was circling slowly round the Queen's Hall with a dry, leathery flapping of its ten-foot wings, while a putrid and insidious odour pervaded the room. The cries of the people in the galleries, who were alarmed at the near approach of those glowing eyes and that murderous beak, excited the creature to a frenzy. Faster and faster it flew, beating against walls and chandeliers in a blind frenzy of alarm. "'The window! For heaven's sake, shut that window!' roared the professor from the platform, dancing and wringing his hands in an agony of apprehension. Alas, his warning was too late. In a moment the creature, beating and bumping along the wall like a huge moth within a gas shade, came upon the opening, squeezed its hideous bulk through it, and was gone. Professor Challenger fell back into his chair with a face buried in his hands, while the audience gave one long, deep sigh of relief as they realized that the incident was over. Then, oh, how shall one describe what took place then, when the full exuberance of the majority and the full reaction of the minority united to make one great wave of enthusiasm? which rolled from the back of the hall, gathering volume as it came, swept over the orchestra, submerged the platform, and carried the four heroes away upon its crest. Good for you, Mac! If the audience had done less than justice, surely it made ample amends. Every one was on his feet. Every one was moving, shouting, gesticulating. A dense crowd of cheering men were round the four travellers. "'Up with them! Up with them!' cried a hundred voices. In a moment four figures shot up above the crowd. In vain they strove to break loose. They were held in their lofty places of honour. It would have been hard to let them down if it had been wished, so dense was the crowd around them. "'Regent Street! Regent Street!' sounded the voices. There was a swirl in the packed multitude, and a slow current, bearing the four upon their shoulders, made for the door. Out in the street the scene was extraordinary. An assemblage of not less than a hundred thousand people was waiting. The close-packed throng extended from the other side of the Langham Hotel to Oxford Circus. A roar of acclamation greeted the four adventurers as they appeared, high above the heads of the people, under the vivid electric lamps outside the hall. A procession! A procession! was the cry in a dense phalanx, blocking the streets from side to side, the crowd set forth, taking the route of Regent Street, Pall Mall, St. James's Street, and Piccadilly. The whole central traffic of London was held up, and many collisions were reported between the demonstrators upon the one side, and the police and taxicab men upon the other. Finally, it was not until after midnight that the four travellers were released at the entrance to Lord John Roxton's chambers in the Albany, and that the exuberant crowd, having sung, They are jolly good fellows, in chorus, concluded their programme with God save the King. 
so ended one of the most remarkable evenings that London had seen for a considerable time. So far my friend Macdona, and it may be taken as a fairly accurate, if florid, account of the proceedings. As to the main incident, it was a bewildering surprise to the audience, but not, I need hardly say, to us. The reader will remember how I met Lord John Roxton upon the very occasion when, in his protective crinoline, he had gone to bring the devil's chick, as he called it, for Professor Challenger. I have hinted also at the trouble which the professor's baggage gave us when we left the plateau, and had I described our voyage I might have said a good deal of the worry we had to coax with putrid fish the appetite of our filthy companion. If I have not said much about it before, it was, of course, that the professor's earnest desire was that no possible rumour of the unanswerable argument which we carried should be allowed to leak out until the moment came when his enemies were to be confuted. One word as to the fate of the London pterodactyl. Nothing can be said to be certain upon this point. There is the evidence of two frightened women that it perched upon the roof of the Queen's Hall, and remained there like a diabolical statue for some hours. The next day it came out in the evening papers that Private Miles, of the Coldstream Guards, on duty outside Marlborough House, had deserted his post without leave, and was therefore court-martialed. Private Miles's account, that he dropped his rifle and took to his heels down the mall, because on looking up he had suddenly seen the devil between him and the moon, was not accepted by the court, and yet it may have a direct bearing upon the point at issue. The only other evidence which I can adduce is from the log of the S.S. Friesland, a Dutch-American liner which asserts that at nine next morning, start point being at the time ten miles upon their starboard quarter, they were passed by something between a flying goat and a monstrous bat, which was heading at a prodigious pace south and west. If its homing instinct led it upon the right line, there can be no doubt that somewhere out in the wastes of the Atlantic the last European pterodactyl found its end. And Gladys! O oh, my Gladys! Gladys of the mystic lake, now to be renamed the Central, for never shall she have immortality through me. Did I not always see some hard fibre in her nature? Did I not, even at the time when I was proud to obey her behest, feel that it was surely a poor love which could drive a lover to his death, or the danger of it? Did I not, in my truest thoughts, always recurring and always dismissed, see past the beauty of the face, and, peering into the soul, discern the twin shadows of selfishness and of fickleness glooming at the back of it? Did she love the heroic and spectacular for its own noble sake, or was it for the glory which might, without effort or sacrifice, be reflected upon herself? Or are these thoughts the vain wisdom which comes after the event? It was the shock of my life. For a moment it had turned me to a cynic. But already, as I write, a week has passed, and we have had our momentous interview with Lord John Roxton, and, well, perhaps things might be worse. Let me tell it in a few words. No letter or telegram had come to me at Southampton, and I reached the little villa at Streatham about ten o'clock that night in a fever of alarm. Was she dead or alive? Where were all my nightly dreams of the open arms, the smiling face, the words of praise for her man who had risked his life to humour her whim? Already I was down from the high peaks, and standing flat-footed upon earth. Yet some good reasons given might still lift me to the clouds once more. I rushed down the garden path, hammered at the door, heard the voice of Gladys within pushed past the staring maid, and strode into the sitting-room. She was seated in a low settee under the shaded standard lamp by the piano. In three steps I was across the room, and had both her hands in mine. Gladys! I cried. Gladys! She looked up with amazement at her face. She was altered in some subtle way. The expression of her eyes, the hard upward stare, the set of the lips— was new to me. She drew back her hands. 
"'What do you mean?' she said. "'Gladys!' I cried. "'What is the matter? You are my Gladys, are you not, little Gladys Hungerton?' "'No,' said she. "'I am Gladys Potts. Let me introduce you to my husband.' How absurd life is! I found myself mechanically bowing and shaking hands with a little ginger-haired man who was coiled up in the deep armchair, which had once been sacred to my own use. We bobbed and grinned in front of each other. "'Father lets us stay here. We are getting our house ready,' said Gladys. "'Oh, yes,' said I. "'You didn't get my letter at Para, then?' No, I got no letter. Oh, what a pity! It would have made all clear. It is quite clear, said I. I've told William all about you, said she. We have no secrets. I am so sorry about it. But it couldn't have been so very deep, could it, if you could go off to the other end of the world and leave me here alone? You're not crabby, are you? No. No, not at all. I think I'll go. Have some refreshment, said the little man, and he added in a confidential way. It's always like this, ain't it? And must be, unless you have polygamy, only the other way round, you understand. He laughed like an idiot, while I made for the door. I was through it, when a sudden fantastic impulse came upon me, and I went back to my successful rival who looked nervously at the electric push. "'Will you answer a question?' I asked. "'Well, within reason,' said he. "'How did you do it? Have you searched for hidden treasure, or discovered a pole, or done time on a pirate, or flown the channel, or what? Where is the glamour of romance? How did you get it?' He stared at me with a hopeless expression upon his vacuous, good-natured, scrubby little face. "'Don't you think all this is a little too personal?' he said. "'Well, just one question,' I cried. "'What are you? What is your profession?' "'I am a solicitor's clerk,' said he. Second man at Johnson and Merivale's, 41 Chancery Lane.' "'Good night!' said I, and vanished, like all disconsolate and broken-hearted heroes, into the darkness, with grief and rage and laughter all simmering within me like a boiling pot. One more little scene, and I have done. Last night we all supped at Lord John Roxton's rooms, and sitting together afterwards we smoked in good comradeship, and talked our adventures over. It was strange under these altered surroundings to see the old, well-known faces and figures. There was Challenger, with his smile of condescension, his drooping eyelids, his intolerant eyes, his aggressive beard, his huge chest swelling and puffing as he laid down the law to Summerlee. And Summerlee, too, there he was with his short briar between his thin moustache and his grey goat's beard. His worn face protruded in eager debate as he queried all Challenger's propositions. Finally, there was our host, with his rugged eagle face, and his cold, blue, glacier eyes with always a shimmer of devilment and of humour down in the depths of them. Such is the last picture of them that I have carried away. It was after supper, in his own sanctum, the room of the pink radiance and the innumerable trophies that Lord John Roxton had something to say to us. From a cupboard he brought out an old cigar-box, and this he laid before him on the table. "'There's one thing,' said he, "'that maybe I should have spoken about before this, but I wanted to know a little more clearly where I was. No use to raise hopes and let them down again, but it's facts, not hopes, with us now. You may remember that day we found the pterodactyl rookery in the swamp, what?' Well, something in the lie of the land took my notice. Perhaps it has escaped you, so I will tell you. It was a volcanic vent full of blue clay. The professors nodded. Well, now, in the whole world I've only had to do with one place there was a volcanic vent of blue clay. That was the great De Beers diamond mine of Kimberley, what? So, you see, I got diamonds into my head. 
I rigged up a contraption to hold off these stinking beasts, and I spent a happy day there with a spud. This is what I got. He opened his cigar-box, and tilting it over he poured about twenty or thirty rough stones, varying from the size of beans to that of chestnuts, on the table. "'Perhaps you think I should have told you, then. Well, so I should. Only I know there are a lot of traps for the unwary, and that stones may be of any size, and yet of little value where colour and consistency are clean off. Therefore I brought them back.' and on the first day at home I took one round to Spinks, and I asked him to have it roughly cut and valued. He took a pill-box from his pocket, and spilled out of it a beautiful glittering diamond, one of the finest stones that I have ever seen. "'There's the result,' said he. He prices the lot at a minimum of two hundred thousand pounds. Of course it is fair shares between us. I won't hear of anything else. Well, Challenger, what will you do with your fifty thousand? If you really persist in your generous view, said the professor, I should found a private museum, which has long been one of my dreams. And you, Summerlee? I could retire from teaching, and so find time for my final classification of the chalk fossils. I'll use my own, said Lord John Roxton in fitting out a well-formed expedition, and having another look at the dear old plateau. As to you, young fella, you, of course, will spend yours in getting married. Not just yet, said I, with a rueful smile. I think, if you will have me, that I would rather go with you. Lord Roxton said nothing, but a brown hand was stretched out to me across the table. End of chapter. End of story. Thank you for listening.